indeed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so, hey, and welcome for me. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about digital scholarly editions, past, present, and future, what we do in the C21 editions. And I also want to give you a little overview of what digital editions are, how they have been, how they have evolved in the past, and give you an outlook on some of the problems that you might face. Um, obviously, when I say we, I mean the C21 editions project which is James, Michael, Orla, Richard, and myself. And we'll start giving you a little bit of an idea of what we, even, what we actually do, you know, um, C21 editions, editing and publishing in a digital age. So we want to understand what the state of the art is in relation to digital editions. Uh, we want to understand what methods and principles are there, what methods and principles might be there in the future and especially we want to engage with experts in the field and based on that we want to build a few prototype editions to kind of advance the field and experiment with new methods. So and how are we doing this? Um, uh, we did about 50 semi-structured interviews right, with people who have worked with digital edition in various uh, forms. That's about 50 hours worth of material that we draw from and that will also be a really important primary source for other people to draw from when they want to understand how the field has evolved. Uh, we're writing a, a report on the state of the art. The picture you're seeing there is from one of our design workshops. So we want to have design workshops where we invite people to researchers and uh, understand their needs in relation to software and infrastructure around digital editions. And then we want to build some prototypes and have more design workshops and understand how they work. Okay, that's enough about us. Let's talk about digital editions. And I want to start in giving you some really high level idea of what a digital edition even is. Why do we call, keep calling it digital? You know, what's the difference between an edition and a digital edition? And then I want to take you through just a little high level overview through the history of digital editions so we understand how they have evolved. And we're going to keep this fairly high level and, and abstract, but you know, what is an edition at all? So an edition in the simplest sense, and I just pulled up this example here, is a critical representation of historic documents. And what that means is this is kind of your base form of an edition. So on one side you'd have your facsimile or you'd have the scan, and on the right side you'd have the transcribed text. And you see it don't know if you can see it, but some of these words are highlighted, which means it's annotation, so you can click on them or hover on them, and it will just explain more about the text there. And keep in mind, this is fairly, even though this is a digital edition, right? this is an online edition, and this is fairly much modeled after a book that would have two pages. But obviously, there's more things that you can do once you have these editions on a computer. And this is something that would be called a critical edition or genetic editing. And what it does now is it compiles a lot of sources that are available for a text. Like think of an ancient text that has been transcribed and went through many hands and exists in a number of different versions. And it compiles them all. And for all of these highlighted words, it shows you the differences that exist between different sources. So this is an important tool for people to study the history of these texts, the history of the transmission of these texts, and you know, how they change over time. So you go into any of these words, and then on the right side it shows you, okay, in, in this one source of what we call a witness, you know, it's, it's written in this way, and then you know, it changes throughout time, throughout different witnesses. And that's already something where we begin to understand that there's a lot of things that you could do here once this is digital. So this is already taken, you know, taken a bit more into the abstract and com using computational power to compile a lot of sources. But of course, there's more things. There's things you know, that you can only do in a digital edition. I use that as an example. So in your browser, that's a, a 3D model. And in your browser, you can move around, you can zoom in and out, and you can look at it from all different angles. And then on the right-hand side, you'd have the transcription of this poem. So we went from you know, fairly kind of, here's a scan and here's the text, to like, um, here's, a, here's a compilation of all the sources that exist, to something, okay, this you definitely couldn't do in a book. And why am I hammering this home? Because that's where something comes in that we call the digital paradigm. Digital paradigm, in a nutshell, is how do we overcome the limitations of printed text? And I put, put in this book wheel here, because this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to use technology 
to do something that, we, that just one single piece of paper, one single book wouldn't allow us to do. And if we take a moment to think about just a number of high level functions that would work really well if we put them in a computer, for example, search functions. Think about if you had an edition of any text and you wanted to search for a word where you could, but you'd have to flip through every single page and kind of mark it up and create your own index, something a computer can do really easily. Uh, reconfiguration of material, which is what we did with the, with the witnesses. You know, just have loads of data and compile it according to some parameters. Time-based media, what we mean with that is mostly um, video or even sound recording. Okay, things obviously you can't do in a book. Um, interactivity, so you know, you, you can interact with this edition. We'll talk a little bit about that. And also something that we call bi-directional communication, which sounds really fancy, but what really means is that obviously information doesn't just flow one way by me reading the book, but if I have a digital edition that allows that, I can also interact with the content that is on there. That's what I want to keep you in mind, this digital paradigm, which is really what sets the digital edition apart from print edition and also from an edition that just happens to be on the screen. Okay, but now it's really time to talk about digital editions, past, present, and future. Uh, what you see there in the background is a little data visualization we did from um, different digital edition projects with their start and end dates and durations. We'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, but first let's get started with the past, with the earliest editions. And it's really important to understand that computerized editions, you know, but you're saying computerized here because we're not really talking about digital editions yet, but they're amongst the oldest DH projects. So there's one that began in 1949 that is often cited as an example. But um, what we are really focused on is editions that follow from the 1980s on. Um, there's a good few editions that started in the 1980s. Uh, here is one example, you know, how this was on, the, on these big tape machines in 82 and then was eventually ported to newer machines. Um, the point I want to make there is many of these editions, they set out to be digital editions and they do that because they think that what they can achieve is worth the extra hassle. And there is a lot of hassle. Um, they share problems of any software development of the time, which especially means the market is tiny. There just aren't many computers around in the 80s and 90s. And there's even less if you make something very specialized, like a digital edition for scholarship, ancient text. The market isn't big enough. You're never going to make any money of it. So publishers stay away at this point. And a lot of different problems they have. One, for example, is the market is fragmented. So what runs on one machine doesn't run on the other machine. There is no D1 system and things change quite quickly. So you don't know if you start developing for one system, will you actually be able to sell that, especially with those edition projects that tend to take 10, 20 years. And also distribution is just really hard. I mean, we're not, there is no internet there, obviously, at least not for the broad market. Uh, there's not even CDs, so it, it's really hard even if you make one, how do you distribute it? What I want to say is those editions are very interested in using digital methods. They don't start out and say, I want to do the same that a book does, but on a screen. No, they say, here's something I could only do with a computer because I have so much data that I need to be able to deal with that in some way. So that's, in a nutshell, you know, the early beginnings of digital editions. And then put this in here, establishment, because pretty much all three things I'm going to talk about are in this picture of Windows 95 CD. Um, really important development is, first of all, you have a growing market. With Windows, you, it kind of becomes clear that this is going to be the big system that most things are going to run on. So you finally have one platform that is worth developing on. And generally, the market just grows to a point that there are enough customers who would be interested. You finally have a suitable distribution media in a CD-ROM, which sounds really silly, but the CD-ROM gives you enough space to put your text on, to put your images on, and also the CD-ROM instance can be sold through a publisher, kind of like a book. You know, this is still pre-internet, so they could just be sold um, just like a book is sold. This makes it far more attractive, and this is also when publishers start to come on board. There's a number of distribution methods for digital editions that we don't need to talk about now, but let's just say having this CD means that you could produce one object and you could sell it through the same channels that you could sell books, which is a big thing. 
Then we, along comes the text encoding initiative, and that's something that we do need to talk about because it's just been so fundamental. So, text encoding initiative, anyone TI, anyone ever heard of that? No. So when I said earlier that the market is fragmented between different operating systems and so on, it gets even worse to the point that there's not even one good way to even produce your edition. Right? They're all custom made. People just set out and they have to kind of reinvent the wheel for a really unique problem. And you obviously want to edit the text. You obviously want to mark this up. You know, this, this word is underlined, this word is crossed out, this word was deleted and later reinserted. And to do that in a way that is machine readable is really, well, it takes a great leap forward, let's say it like that. In the late 80s, when Text Encoding Initiative releases their first set of guidelines, and just to give you a really brief example, you see this um, text here on the right about uh, Werther, and you see on the left how that would look in XML. And this is not a course in XML, so don't worry about it. Uh, what's really important is you have these tags and they include content, very much like HTML. If you work with HTML, this might look familiar to you. And with that, the TI kind of strikes the perfect balance between having a system that is flexible enough so that you could encode almost any kind of content in it and also being um, standardized enough so that it would be compatible between different editions and different systems. That obviously is then expanded throughout the years, but that's the first time where you really see some, some big standardization of the field. So all this growth that you have before, you know, that is encouraged because you finally have a big enough market to sell it on. Um, once that hits this something standardization, it really takes a big leap forward. So what happens then, the numbers start to grow. Um, here's some more data which you see from the 80s on, you have uh, projects starting every year kind of peaks in 2007, but stays on a high level, and the project duration goes down a little bit. So what happens at some point is that some, definitely not all, but some problems are solved, right? And digital scholarly editions become more standardized. They don't become uniform, but they become somewhat standardized. We're still, like, on a time level, we're still maybe moving up to the early 2000s. Additionally, digital scholarly editions also gain recognition as independent forms of content, not just additions to printed books. So it's no longer the case that you would make your edition in book form and then you say, okay, now I'm also going to do the same on a CD-ROM uh, just because, you know. So it kind of starts to shift a little bit that those new tools and methods become, are more appreciated and that it turns into the digital scholarly edition becoming an independent form and even sometimes seen as the primarily best form to present content with. And then we are still somewhat pre-internet, so nearing the present, obviously this somehow changes, there's an expansion of what an edition even is. Should it, it include text? We talked a lot about text. Um, but what about images? What about video? What about interactive content? And especially what about born digital content? So things that aren't the result of digitization, not scans, not transcriptions, but maybe websites or interactive content, maybe games. Could there be anything additional like in that? And then making use, you know, talked about bidirectional communication. Uh, something comes along that's called social editing. Ever heard of Letters of 1916, for example? That, that uh, was a big project out of Maynooth. And obviously that collected letters from and around the East Arising and the Irish Civil War, and people could submit their letters, but people could also transcribe letters themselves, and then they would be approved, and once they were cleared, they would become part of the collection. And that's something that, you know, we've slightly been working towards, but there's those collections, or those editions are now online. And only when they're online can you have this bi-directional communication, whatever with other researchers or with the general public. Also, when they're online, you could start by having a few texts and then expanding it throughout the years, whereas if you make a CD-ROM, it just has to be done at some point because you need to ship out the CD-ROM. So, um, yeah, we have that social editing, but it also leads to scholars now have to wear many more hats than they used to. Um, publishers slowly... Well, no, it becomes clear that open access is going to be the way forward at some point, which means that um, usually the scholars themselves will be responsible for the entire edition. 
the publisher wouldn't be there as much as they used to be in, in the 90s, say. That also means a lot of jobs that the publisher would do previously, such as marketing, design, distribution, um, would now have to be done by the scholars themselves. And that leads, again, you know, because there's more workload needs to increase the need for tools. That's a big thing that changes once we kind of near the present editions that they are now online. It has now become the default that this, those editions would be online. And then in the 2010 years, it also becomes clear that if you want to get EU funding for your digital edition, it would have to be open access. So you couldn't sell access to it anymore, which also means that most likely the scholar themselves would have to take care of the entire edition. And then there's this big thing about, you know, I talked about born digital content. So once you go into the realms of born digital content, once you deal with, with, with anything that you just get from the internet, you kind of have a question, how do you deal with an abundance of information? And remember that digital editions coming from textual scholarship, they would be, that's a very, that's a generalization, but they would be more accustomed to conditions of scarcity, to just not having enough sources, then they would be to conditions of abundance, that is having too much or having more that you could realistically survey um, yourself. So the example I used here is a Twitter analysis of, um, among the Easter Rising commemoration. And you know, you could ask yourself a few questions there, and it's like, how do you select material? How do you present it? If you have let's just say 10,000 tweets. How do you present 10 and say these are representative of, of everything? You know, how do you weigh them? Um, how do you select them? How do you find them? How do you scope them? That's, those are questions that now as you go into the present, digital editions have to answer. How do you do that? Is, for example, AI a tool that you want to use to automatically collect sources? Is, you know, what tools do you need? And as, especially as you move further and further away from this initial approach of simply having text, you would have to wonder, how do we deal with that? You know, how do we deal with this material? We have some workflows that are all based around text, and once we go into an area, once we kind of leave text behind, we have to find new workflows. Important question I put there is, can digital scholarly editions interact with each other? And the answer is usually no. The answer is usually they're just there by themselves. They are still somewhat custom-made. There's no few would have an API, but if they have an API, the API call wouldn't be standardized. So even though we are in this internet age, um, this CD-ROM model is still kind of there, which means that each edition stands for itself and interacting with each other is usually not a given. So those are some of the questions that we deal with and in the project in just trying to understand what new challenges are there, what new material do editions deal with and how can we engage with them. So conclusion question mark really, um, if there's one thing I want to bring home then it's that digital scholarly editions are amongst the oldest forms of humanities computing, so they're older than the, old, the term digital humanities. And they have a long history of adapting to new conditions. They are usually not just digitized editions, but they're usually editions that try and embrace the methods uh, of computational. And this continues on. So they're, they're not a, a static object. They're not something that just exists in an unchanged form for 40 years. But they've always been something that tries to push the boundaries. Uh, some problems were solved through sanitization, and new content brings new challenges. I just talked about how the TI standards for me, they struck this perfect balance between flexibility and standardization. And now, as you start to move away from text as a majority of content, can we do something like this again? Can we give people a system that is somewhat easy to use, that is somewhat standardized, but still flexible enough to embrace whatever form of content there might be there? And can digital editions be both standardized and flexible? And then because Halloween is coming up, I put this scary pumpkin there with the 404 on it, uh, which is something that we haven't even talked about, but it is also important that, you know, I said publishers are not as present as they used to be, and usually it's up to the scholar to do that. Um, all these editions are online now, which means they cost money. Like, it's an ongoing commitment both in, in time and, and in financial means to keep them around, you know, websites need to be updated, 
um, on a minimum level, you, you need to put work in so things stay around. Um, there is a chance, and it keeps happening, that all this work that someone puts in an edition disappears because there is no supporting infrastructure. So as long as soon as there is no more funding, they're somewhat at risk of disappearing um, because they're usually individual projects. And this is also something that we look into is trying to understand what kind of scholarly infrastructure do um, people need to produce digital scholarly editions. And then with that, with that little overview, I want to leave you and I want to thank you all very much for following along. I put some links there, so this is the C21 Editions website. That's our Twitter. If you want to get in touch with me, then that's also my Twitter there. If, especially looking at your projects, you find this whole topic interesting and you want to learn more about it, there is three really good books, uh, but three really good sources rather, that are all available online. And I'll share the slides with you. So if you're looking for anything like further reading, then that would be very good starting points. And then coming back to XML, there's a Q&A tag, and you see that it's open, which means that we're now in the Q&A stage. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask them. I'll do my very best to answer them. Thank you very much.